the third commandment defend God's holy name. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, even before the Israelites arrived at Mount Sinai, God revealed his name was Yahweh. And as we heard and read from the scripture responding reading just now, Moses asked for God's name in the fire of bushes. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, the I am has sent me to you. So the I am who I am, God reveals his name and it refers to God's self-existence, self-sufficiency, and his sovereignty. As the incidents of the Exodus begins to unfold through the leading of Moses, the name also reveals the power of God's salvation. In their own redemptive experience, the people of Israel, they knew that the God could reveal his name to Moses was a redeemer the god who revealed his name to moses he is a powerful god the god who revealed his name to moses this god is different than the gods and the idols they worship in the land of egypt so when we try to understand the meaning of god's name we soon realize that yahweh lord is not just clearly a name but also a manifestation of God's nature. And that's how Hebrews culture understand names. For most people, a name is just a label. For most people, a name is just a name. Something we must have, but not an identity of who we are. But for Hebrews, name is inseparable from their identity. So when we use God's name, we are referring to his divine attributes. God's name represents himself. And especially if you turn to the Bible in Psalm chapter 8, verse 1, and you will see then how the psalmist prays God. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And when the psalmist look at, look at God's creation, he sees how glorious God's creation is. God's glory is manifesting in every creation. If you see the tree, there is God's wisdom in it. If you see the whole creation, God's glory is, is in this creation because he is the God of glory. Even in God's redeeming work of his people, Psalm 106, verse 8 says, Yet he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. So the Israelites, they absolutely know that God's name, it is not just a name. God's name is connected with his character. God's name is connected with his character. So the purpose of this commandment is that it pleases God that we should take his name as holy. And in short, we are not to blaspheme the name of God in an ungodly manner. And in this commandment, God not only forbids us to take his name in vain, but in the other way, God also calls us to be reverent and also be cautious in our thoughts and words concerning all things that pertain to God and His mysteries and to honor Him in our thoughts and also in our own conduct. So, 
there is a structure. The first commandment forbids us to have other gods. We must know, worship, and fear this only one true God. God commands us to worship the right target. And therefore, the second commandment forbids us to worship in a wrong and self-central way. Because when we know the God we worship, because when we know who He is, then we should worship Him with reverence. So the third commandment deals with the attitude of our worship. Not just our speech, but also our conduct. So you are going to see a very clear pattern in the first three of ten commandments. The first deals with the who of worship, the object of worship. And the second deals with how, the how we worship, the way we worship. And the third deals with the attitude of worship. And it draws us back to the first commandment, the who of worship. And these three commandments, they are the foundation of all the Ten Commandments. So to speak, the foundation of the entire Christian's life. If you get the first commandment wrong, and everything will just break. And if you get the, get the second commandment wrong, and in the same way, everything will just break down. The first three of ten commandments, it is the foundation of the Christian life. And the pattern can also be seen among non-Christians and also pagan. Even though we might think that the God they worship is not a true God, when we look at the way they worship their ancestors and their idols, and we can see that they worship sincerely and warn people around them, do not disrespect my ancestors. Do not disrespect the thing I worship. Now, my friends, you are more blessed than the pagans and non-Christians because you have believed in the one true God. But let's just pause for a moment and ask ourselves, do we know who is this God, though we claim that we are Christians? Do you know his character? And if we know his attributes, how do we worship him? And what is your attitude when you come before his presence? Do you stand in awe when you worship and call upon his name? And let's hear again the word of God. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. And thus in this reading of God's holy, inspired, and in inerrant word. So may he write its living truth upon our hearts. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we ask that you would teach us that in what it means not to take your name in vain. And then by grace enables us to walk in honor of your holy name. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what does it mean to take the name of the Lord in vain? Sometimes we underestimate this commandment in, especially in and of itself, our speech, don't we? So if you have a Bible along with you, let us all turn to Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16. The Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16.
And the word of God says in this way, and I'll be reading in the ESV versions, whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. Now, again, as we have just learned in the introduction of the Ten Commandments in Sunday school, this is the civil law for the nation of Israel. But as we have said, the civil law is no longer valid in the age of the New Testament. The parallel for us would be church discipline, not public execution, stoning them to death. Now, but this portion clearly shows us the severity of this sin. Even the sojourner was liable to punishment. Whether you were the member of Israel in those days, or maybe you were just a visitor or native-born, it was to be understood that when you step in their land, the name of the Lord is holy and no one shall take his name in the casual manner. Now here's the thing. God does not forbid us to use his name. Some conservative Jews have gone so far with the third commandment that they simply never call God by his name to avoid misuse. But that is not God's intention. God's holy name is found everywhere in the Old Testament and he reveals his name so that we can call on him personally and increase our affection and love for him. God does not forbid us to use his name, but he forbids us to abuse his name. God forbids the careless, thoughtless, reckless expression of his name as if God doesn't care at all or if he doesn't exist at all. If we treat God's name as worthless when we know it carries a deep meaning, we are diminishing and blaspheming his holy name. But what does it mean to take the name of God in vain? And we can look at it in three perspectives. First is making false vows in the name of God. And it is common for people to use the phrase, I swear, 我发誓, I swear, I swear to God. And people will use the name of God to prove that what they say is true, in effect, making God their witness. Have you had some similar experience when you have the conversation with your friends or with your families? And when you have a really rough conversations and the other opponents, they just bring, throws out the word, I swear to God, God says this to me. And you have no choice but to believe that sentence since you bring God into our conversation. But if a person vows in God's name and tells the lie, then there is a problem. This is lying. And they steal God's holy name and make people believe something that is wrong. Again, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12 says, You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am your, I am the Lord. And we need to understand then, it is permissible to make a lawful vows and oath. So again, if you have a Bible along with you, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 31. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 
31. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21. And the word of God says in this way, If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. Now here God permits and commands us to take vow, but the key is to swear by the true God and to be truthful, not to be false, not to lie. Once a person swears in the name of God or in his presence, bear in mind that it is an invitation for God to witness my words, the conversation between you and me. And this means we are not only promising before God, hey God, I promise you, I will fulfill what I said to this guy. But at the same time, I also promise God that if I do not fulfill of what I promise, I am bound to agree and accept that God will discipline me for breaking my words and promise. And even Jesus didn't oppose taking oaths and vows He also opposed the object and the pattern of how we take vows and oaths. And again, let's all turn to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 to 22. The book of Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 to 22. Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 through 23. Now here's how Jesus says about taking vows and oaths. Woe to you blind guides who said, If anyone swears by the temple, there is, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the goal of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you said, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by the heavens swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it and so on. But here is the problem. In Jesus' day, those Jewish rabbis and Pharisees created another swearing, vowing system that completely undermined the purpose of vowing an oath. And from the teachings of the Pharisee, they say that you don't need to take vows in the name of God. And some vows were not even necessarily binding. It all depends on how you take vows and who or what you vow to. Oaths and vows are no longer sworn in God's name, but it is all a loopholes to avoid God's punishment. For example, if, if you look at verse 16, And see how Pharisee swore. If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the goal of the temple, he is bound by his oath. The oath you swear by the temple does not count. But the oath you swear by the goal of the temple does. That's the loophole of taking vow. 
But Jesus said, no matter who or what you are vowing to, you are taking oath in the presence of God and also in His name. Because if someone vows by the heaven, the heavens are God's throne. So you are vowing to God. If someone vows by the earth, Jesus says, the earth is God's footstool, so you are vowing to God. And if someone vows by Jerusalem, Jesus says that God is the king in, of the city. So in this way, you are vowing to the king of Jerusalem. Even if we vow by our hair, bodies, we are still vowing to God because He is the God of our head and body. He is the God who sustains our life. And we can say even more and more. And whether you vow to anyone else, you are indirectly vowing to God and inviting Him to be your witness. Because everything is connected to God. Most importantly, it is already a wrong way and pattern to vow to creation itself. So in other words, if you cannot commit in doing something, if you don't have a full picture of something, don't try to use God's name to convince people to believe. That's a sin. Second, define God's name in the name of God. And we can look how we often define God's holiness in three ways. And first of all, it occurs in our prayer sometimes. And not only we need to avoid some showy prayers, but we also need to avoid sloppy prayers. And sometimes our prayers can be completely empty phrases. And sometimes we pray even in the thoughtless way. And I will hear some prayer like this. Dear Father, thank you for dying on the cross for me. And dear Jesus, thank you for sending the Father into the world, to be born in the world. Something like this. Or we will be just so quickly say the grace at the table, something like this, dear God, thank you, amen. Done. Now the problem is not a short prayer. The problem is that sometimes a lot of prayer seems to be thoughtless, too careless by simply toasting out the name of God without a right attitude, without con even considered what we are praying. And secondly, we also need to avoid using God's name as curse or jokes, making fun and jokes about Him. People nowadays curse God when things get wrong and use the name of Jesus as an exclamation. Especially in movies, even non-Christians, even atheists often curse God though they don't believe God is this. As Christians, we need to be careful with our words. And most Christians, I believe, will probably not be too rude, but will probably at least express their emotions in a mild way. For example, God damn it. Gosh darn it. Oh my God, good Lord. Jeez, I swear to God, and so on. Now, some people may think this is just a form of expression. I'm just expressing my feeling. But I would want to throw my questions to you. What's the meaning of these expressions? And why are we all using the name of God for nothing? And a joking to God's name is, is also inappropriate. And we need to further consider using the, the name of God as a punchline or a joke's content. 
and people will laugh at laugh at us. Why being so conservative? Why can Christians afford jokes? And yes, we love jokes, but it depends how you manage and speak about this joke. Why can't we afford jokes, or using God as a punchline? But I will counter these people by saying: Would you casually make fun or make jokes about Malaysia May thirteen, MH three seven zero? Or do you even make fun or make jokes about Jewish Holocaust? To this end, we need to pay attention whenever we thoughtlessly bring out the word. Let us pause for a second and ask why. If the God I believe in, if the God we believe in, He is the great God. He has majestic name. Why would I? Carelessly express his name in this way. Does my exclamation has a meaning? And third, God has spoken to me. God has spoken to me. Now, in the Old Testament, false prophets often used the name of God to preach what they wanted to say. And even if we refer to the church history, it is all full of false prophets who spoke in God's name to increase their credibility. From the Crusades to slave trade in America, from politics to social organizations, the leaders of these events would say, "God has spoken to me, so you shall listen." To support their position, and that's happening in the church, not just in political arena. And may I ask if this is true for us? And how many times have we used God's name to satisfy our own desires? For example, when you know that an investment has a huge risk of failure, you're going to lose all the money. But to convince yourself and your friends and family, and you look up to the scripture in different places and say to yourself, convince yourself and your friends, "Hey, buddy, God says to me it's okay, so come on in." Or when a church wants to renovate the building or there's a need to buy a new building, and maybe leaders will say, and Share the vision in this way. We spent two weeks in prayer. We've convinced that God told us to buy this building, and that's all. We will have a bazaar. We need everyone to participate in this bazaar, and please, guys, put all your money in, because that's what God tells us. Tell me what you all need to do. And we can't claim divine authority for a capital campaign. Yes, we can express and share the event in the right and humble way. But to claim divine authority to satisfy my desire—that's a sin. Third way: failure to practice the word of God, though we. Claim His name, though we praise His name, though we call upon His name every time. If you have a Sunday bulletin, you can refer to what Thomas Watson said. And the Puritan Thomas Watson said, sharply and rightly, and he said, when men's tongues and lives are contrary to one another. When under a mass of profession, they lie and cozen, and are unclean, they make use of God's name to abuse Him and take it in vain. Listen to the last word: pretended holiness 
is merely double wickedness. Strong word. Now, when we think about our approach to worship, whether it be congregational worship, public worship, or whether it be our private life, other than the worship service, the most common things that happen is that we get absent-minded when we worship or when we look at the Word of God. And yes, we can be sympathized and we can recognize that we are easily get distracted. But that doesn't mean that we can't pay attention to the hymns we sing, the scriptures we read, or the sermons we hear. And sometimes we care nothing about the words we sing, we hear, and we read. Most importantly, we sin every time. We stain the name of God by which we call. The church has too little fear of God and little reverence before His majesty. God is considered insignificant because we never take Him seriously. Maybe we are reading the Word of God, but our minds are on and other things. Maybe we are singing the hymns, but we don't know what we are singing. singing. Maybe we come before God, open your Bible in your private worship or public worships, but we don't recognize His glory and honor. And our attitude of worship is casual and insincere, and in so doing, we dishonor the name of God, though we always call upon the name of God. Remember one incident, almost 2,000 years ago, a group of people praised and welcomed Jesus. They call him the king, and they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the atmosphere, it was full of praise, joyful moment. People stand hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, welcome the skin to this land. And after five days later, the same people shout, crucify him. They took his name in vain. Though five days ago, they praised Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. If, if you and I would be honest, we blaspheme his name all the time. And it is possible to praise the name of God and memorize tons of His Word, and we never really mean it in our hearts. Even though the third commandment requires us not to misuse the name, but on the positive side, the, th- the third commandment also commands us to use God's name correctly. We are to hallow the name of God. And that reminds us of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And this is especially dedicated and set apart for a divine purpose. That is, God wants us to use his name only in worship and praise. There are many ways to use God's name properly. God's name can be praised, glorified, proclaimed, exalted, worshipped, and trust. And the psalm teaches to sing the name, sing his glory. And it also teaches to bless his name. And elsewhere in the Bible teaches we need to call upon his name when we are in trouble or in ups and downs. And trust in his name and give thanks because of him. 
And we need to realize that those who break the third commandment will be considered as guilty, will be punished by God. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And the scripture does not say how. But it seems, it may seem like an understatement, but God does not consider those who take his name to be without sin. So taking God's name in vain is a very serious sin. It is a direct violation of God's honor and glory. And because we often break the third commandment, God promises if we confess our sins and repent of them, He will forgive them because Christ was nailed to the cross for all our sins, including, of course, the third commandment. It is because we often take God's name in vain that we need to call on Jesus' name for forgiveness. Now, Jesus repeatedly taught his disciples to pray in his name. To pray in his name is to acknowledge that our access to God comes only through Jesus. Because originally as sinners, we are separated from God and we have lost the fellowship with Him. But through Jesus Christ and by faith alone, our fellowship with God is restored. By grace, the Holy Spirit unites us to Christ and grants us the entrance into the fellowship that Jesus has with his heavenly Father. And now we are able to call Jesus Father, our Father, and to experience this intimate, life-giving communion with him. And when we consider our sinfulness and God's holiness, we can be discouraged from praying. And we might believe that God doesn't want to hear us because of our failures or because he is tired of hearing us confess the same sins over and over again. But the good news is because of Jesus' name, when believers when we call on Father in prayer, we do so in precious name of Jesus and cover his, in His righteousness. And when the Father listens to our prayers, He delights to answer anyone who calls on His name in the name of His Son. So our prayers are accepted and are heard because of the interceding Christ. So it is right and wise to say the word in Jesus' name when we pray. To do so, we honor the sole meditarial words of Jesus and we glorify the Father who appointed him to be the high priest for us. So my friends, let me urge you, now that Jesus has opened a new and a living way for us, and now that God hears our prayers because of Christ, and now that Christ made us possible to come to God without reservation and fear, and now God, and now we can call on the name Father without fear, so let us be determined not to despise God's name again. Love it, treasure it, and praise His name. And finally, Christ's warning, last warning, is worth heeding. In Judgment Day, we will all be judged by God. And God's approach to us will depend on our attitude toward Him. And I would like to direct your attentions to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. On that day, 
Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did I, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty words in your name? And then I will declare them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And that's a shocking warning. Those who thought they have served God for years and years, and Christ said, I have never recognized you because they have never believed in Christ. And in the previous text, it is also mentioned those who keep saying, Lord, 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 Lord. Praise the name, Lord. Praise the name, Lord. Lord, Lord. Those are the people who think they know Christ. Those are the people who said, who always glorify the name of Christ. And those are the people who always sit in the worship service on Sunday. Those are the people who said they have do lots of devotion and call on the name of the Lord. But on that day, those who thought they praised the name of Christ, those who thought they call on the name of Christ, they will be perished on that day. Those who claim to be Christians but take the name of the Lord in vain will be judged even though they have put God's name on their lips, but they have never feared God throughout their lives. And I think that warning should serve us some kind of terror, and it should prompt us to live in accordance to His word with the right attitude. And on that day, the name of Christ will be glorified. As we have gone through the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, and since God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and the glory of God the Father. If this is the honor that Christ will receive in the last day, then he is worthy of this glorious and mighty name now. And we ought to live and give, live for him and give him the glory and not blaspheme the name of God. Let's pray. And will Lord and our God be gracious to us. Whenever we say or we add and proclaim your name is above every name, that by the grace of the Spirit, by the grace of you, help us that we would mean it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.